Halo, Season 2, Episode 7. Basically, the biggest cook story there ever was. They call the episode Thermopylae to hail back to the stand of the 300 Spartans. This is Sparta! But what do we get? Training exercise for kids and that other than a small scuffle involving Soren and the finale of the McKee fight, which started at the end of the previous episode, the only action within this episode happens completely off-screen. That is one big pile of shit. And that's even if you can call it an action sequence, because it just happens on a heads-up display, and basically everyone dies. There's a saying that there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only stupid answers. The problem with this show is it doesn't answer questions, or it just looks stupid when it does. Now, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but the problem with this show is that the writers have free reign through their alternate timeline bullshit. But they are using and referencing the canon material on a continuous basis and changing it to suit their own needs. The key issue with this, however, is that they don't even understand the effects that these changes have on the story in the first instance, let alone the further ramifications that occur further down the line, which then requires them to change things further. Now, usually they end up doing one of three things, which is try to fill in the plot holes, but they fill them in with hole-eating quicksand, which creates bigger plot holes. Then, their other option is to ignore the plot holes entirely, which they do in so many instances, leaving us just with a raft of questions that are never answered, and we are left to extrapolate the meaning and the reasoning behind all of these actions. And the third thing that they do is they successfully navigate the plot hole with an absolute nothing burger that makes no sense at all. But no matter what option the writers choose, ultimately it only serves to further deviate the storyline from anything that anyone knows. Now, I know that this is based on the Silver Timeline, and it is not supposed to represent Halo. But what the writers and the showrunners are doing here is alienating their core audience. The very audience which you're supposed to be able to bank on to watch your show. But this, as each episode passes, is beginning to represent less and less what anyone understands Halo to be. And it never really represented it in any shape or form to begin with, either. Now what I can say that we did get from this episode was effectively filler. There was some development, obviously trying to lead us towards the final episode and ultimately what is going to happen there. But within this filler, we still get that continuation of what I'd actually say is the most memorable thing about the Halo TV series in its entirety, which is plot holes, bad writing, and nonsensical developments, all of which serve to stretch the realms of plausibility more than any show I've actually sat through. With that, let's take a detailed dive at the episode. So ultimately, we pick up where we left off. Both John and McKee have touched the artifact, and both being taken to the Halo. On reach, brought the Covenant there. Yes, she did, and she was so cut up about it. Millions of people gone because of you. Because of war. McKee, of course, however, just deflects her responsibility now, which is just typical of how they've written her. Or actually, is it? Because in episode 5, she was clearly displaying guilt over the death of everyone on Reach, and she was crying as she saw the devastation, but now she's just shirked all responsibility, said, well, you know, it's war, who cares? It just seems like she endlessly oscillates between remorse and I don't care. Move. You need to move. <laughs> but if that's typical of McKee, what we see here is typical of John. Overly emotional. He clearly still cares about her for some reason. She's a bloody monster, mate. I'd go as far as to say she's pretty much the worst addition to this whole universe. No. Actually, wait. We've still got Quan. I am starting to notice this more and more as we see elites fighting. They all seem to rely only on plasma swords. Where's the plasma rifles? 
So just to give some context, basically this is a follow-up of the fight at the end of episode 6, where the priest basically wants to kill her because she's disingenuous, I guess, and the Arbiter has decided to side with McKee. And ultimately, they've both escaped the combat that was going on on the bridge, and he's now hunting her down. And I'll be honest, I am very much Team Priest. But then Cortana rocks up, distracts the priest, so that McKee can sneak up behind him and kill him. Did you find it? So yes, she found it. And this pretty much gives rise to the first colossal plot hole of this episode. So there are several problems with her somehow magicking the map. Why did touching one artifact allow McKee to finish the map? The map was incomplete. It did not have all of the coordinates in order to ascertain the location of Halo. We know that from season one. But somehow, she touches a keystone and can plug in the gaps of the map. Now, she couldn't see the stars. Cortana's not in her head, so she can't extrapolate the location because of points of reference or anything stupid like that. So, logically, there is no reason why McKee has has now finished the map and found the location of Halo. Other than, they need to move the story forward. I know that a lot of you won't want to cast your mind back to Season 1, but if you remember, the way that the map was shown was you needed both keystones. And the both keystones, the smaller one, went inside the larger one, and then basically produced the map. Now, the map was incomplete because McKee was killed by Kai, or so we thought. So... If we needed two artifacts in Season 1 to get the map, why do we only need one artifact to finish the map in Season 2? It doesn't make sense. It's just another unexplained plot mechanism in order to move the f story forward. So we rejoin Akerson and Perangovsky. They're both going tit for tat basically blaming the other for the incompetence. Akerson's now realising that Perangovsky's basically going to just dump everything on him with regards to Reach. Perangovsky's effectively become a heartless, careless leader who is all about the outcome of what happens here, rather than how she has to get to the outcome. If I had to sum up Perangovsky's character arc, is they've effectively replaced who Halsey was from season one with Perangovsky. But there's little to no reasoning as to why. In fact, it's not dead. It'll lead to inconvenient questions about Reach, don't you? Inconvenient questions? What, you mean like you leaving everyone to die? It's not really an inconvenient question. You were in charge. Acting on your orders. I'm not even in the ONI. So how is she even in charge? It doesn't make sense and it's not explained as to why. Base in the SOWEL system. So they basically discover the entire fleet of the Covenant, um, with the help of Cortana, which is now in the SOWEL system. So we rejoin Chief and Cortana, finally working together like hand in glove. Pretty much one of the grounding fundamentals of the entire Halo universe. Why have we had to wait 16 episodes to start really seeing this happen? This is what we've wanted the whole time. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the only part of this bloody show that actually is starting to feel a bit like Halo. Although I will go to say that Cortana still isn't right for me. What we needed was we needed the Cortana from Season 1 to be in Season 2, but Instead of humanizing her colors like they did in season one, they just needed to make the first Cortana blue. And then I think we would have had a much more true to form Cortana, both in looks and voice. On your knees. So Chief gets stopped by a detachment of the, I guess, Marine Police and Queen Bitch, as we will call her. But John kind of talks his way out of this situation somehow and explains to them all that... She's trying to shirk her responsibility by ordering them to shoot him, because then they're responsible for the death of Master Chief. Which is a nice way to go around it. But all I really want to see is Chief rip her apart. I have orders to take him down. Those aren't your orders. He's resisting. Take him down. He wasn't resisting. He was just responding. There is a massive difference. You're quite clearly trying to talk your soldiers into killing him. Shoot him. Do it yourself. We got more grit from that Marine than we've had from pretty much any Marine in 16 episodes of show. And if that wasn't a fuck you, I don't know what was. Stop right there! Now that was oddly gratifying. 
but I still really wanted Chief to do it. Didn't ask for your help. I wouldn't have either. She's a backstabber. What are you doing, Chief? You're showing her your back. I'm surprised that the knife still isn't in there. My enemy's about to learn that there's a cost to tangling with humans. I'm asking you to deliver the bill. She's delivering a bill, and what she's actually delivering is a whole load of corpses. So surely the Covenant should be sending her the bill? Those beeps? That's the sound of dead bodies. So at least it's being true to form. I mean, as per the canon, the Spartan 3s pretty much died to a man. Deploy the second wave. Yes, I'm actually finding Perengovsky as a character really interesting. She's so calm, knowing that she's basically just sending all of these people to their deaths. And I really like her character this season, as she's genuinely heartless. You could probably say almost callous, with just how everyone is expendable. She's someone who is required to be in charge, but almost reprehensible. And that makes it believable that someone like her would be in charge. But that's about the end of the praise that I can give the writers for her. Because they'd have been much better off just introducing a new character like they did with Ackerson and have him be that person. Don't have him be subservient to someone else. Just have him be that necessary dick. And the reason for this is Perengovsky is not the same character she was last season in any way, shape or form. And... Having her become this person, this head honcho in charge of humanity's entire defense against the Covenant, just raises so many questions, and they're not answered in any way, shape, or form. Chief of which is, how did she become the head honcho? She lost her command because of the absolute shit show at the end of season one with Halsey. We know from season one that there were a lot of of people who were more senior than her in season one. And an absolute debacle like what she hadn't at the end of season one does not get you promoted above all of the people who are in front of you. But in this show, you get promoted to a much more senior position where you can mess up even harder than before. It just doesn't make sense. It's more likely that when they abducted and hid away Halsey, at the end of season one to season two, that in the cell beside her would have been Perengovsky. And yet, there's no reasoning at all given for why she has become as senior an individual as she has, despite all of her failures previously. Another question is, why have you framed her so differently to how she was in season one? It doesn't make sense. The things that she does are genuinely retarded and like, so throw something at the wall and see what sticks. In season one, she tried to distance herself and even refuse and order Halsey not to go ahead with all of her illegal AI plans and everything. But now, she's not defending planets, she's actively advising the mass expendability of every human asset into the meat grinder of war, into this one single battle. Civilians, soldiers, Spartans, they're all expendable so that she can see her goal come about. And it's not just Perengovsky, it's every female character from season one has had their personality either tilted or completely changed. Character arcs have been repeated. It's actually making the entirety of the Halo show a self-contained trope, where they're repeating the same things that they've done before. And I've never seen that in a show. At least not that I can think of. It's actually the most impressive thing I've seen so far about this show. Apart from, of course, how impressively shocking the writing is. No, the first wave just got obliterated, now you're sending more. And what we have is we have this almost redemption arc of Ackerson as well. Because he, he's genuinely racked with guilt, and this scene makes him seem like he's the one with a conscience. And Perengovsky's basically the dick. But only three to four episodes ago, we were all sat there going, Ackerson's a dick. I'll be honest, the Soren section of this entire episode is largely a nothing burger. And that's pretty true to form of this season. Other than rescuing Chief in episode five from Reach, them, Quan, have added practically nothing to this season of any meaningful substance. At least so far. But in this scene, we basically learn that Soren was hung up about Halsey and wanted to find her, not because of retribution, but because he wanted a way back to being a Spartan. Because he felt that as a Spartan, he mattered. Now his wife shits all over this, 
by reminding him that he has a family and he should matter anyways. But Soren's clearly torn because he feels the people that he grew up with and came to rely on are also his family. Now I quite liked that slight bit of warring there between his family and his friends who ultimately were his family. Now what I did however mind about this whole scene is Soren wants Kessler to go through this training so that he can find out the person that he is and have the kinds of relationships that Soren had when Soren was younger. But his wife shits all over this and basically suggests that she doesn't want her son to be a killer like Soren. Now, this is all kind of very hypocritical, as she threatened the shopkeep in episode 5 with violence. And she's very happy, and has been very happy, for Soren to use his Spartan training and his ability for violence whenever it suits her to advance her position. I mean, she was basically queen bitch on the rubble. And that was all based on Soren's aptitude for violence, his training. Now, I know that she might want better for her son, but it just kind of seems like she's trying to have her cake and eat it. I'm gonna mess this up. Take it easy. You're okay. And this is just more of the utter bollocks that we've come to expect with Perez. She's making it sound like she's some sort of veteran to this other recruit, I guess. When, in fact, she was a petrified mess in episode one. Which, in series time, is only around a week or so ago. She was completely and utterly useless on the fall of Reach. Which, in universe time, was only about four to five days ago. She claims that she was part of that battle, but she never picked up a weapon in any way, shape, or form, and never used any weapon against the Covenant. She just left the planet. So, I don't understand where she gets this self-suredness from, because the only thing that she could be sure of from everything that we've seen of her in this series so far is that she's an utter liability. No two ways about it. You're just scared of being scared. You won't have time to be scared for yourself. Personally, I wouldn't take any advice off her in any way, shape, or form, no matter how sensible it sounds. But you lied to us. You put us in harm's way. You got us grounded. He didn't lie to you about anything that mattered in any way, shape, or form. If anything, he told you more truth than he did anyone else. He confided in you that McKee was still alive and that he saw her. Meanwhile, you just assumed that he was mental and shouldn't be trusted because of that. And as for lying about the permission to fly to Visegrad, where he was effectively arrested. He did that because he cared about Cobalt Team and thought they were in danger. Because he thought that the Covenant was on reach. Now the thing that you should be asking yourself, or rather saying to yourself, is that turns out he was right and that I should have trusted him. But this isn't the only time that he was right, because he was right about McKee, which you were told about, but glossed completely over, in the previous episode. And in the previous episode, you also turned around and said, I've always trusted Chief. But if you had actually always trusted Chief, then you would have believed that he had a rational reason to do what he did. But you didn't trust him. Your superiors covered it all up, just as Chief told you in the last episode, which you also didn't trust him then, until after you'd caved his face in. So, you just don't trust him. Why not just be honest and say, I don't know if I can trust you? But instead, they are trying to maintain this relationship between the two characters like this. But there's so many things which have happened which would fracture that relationship irrelevantly. Reparably. Supposed to do, I had to make a call. You made the wrong call. Damn right she did. Yap, 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 yap. That's basically the entirety of this scene. Um, I don't even know where to start. They're just sat around yapping about what they found in the Forerunner loot box, I guess we'll call it. And they are once again talking about how Halsey took children, but the reason she took the children was because they shared genetic information with the genome that she discovered here. Now, what doesn't make sense, of course, is that John is the only Spartan that can interact with any of the Forerunner tech. So they're trying to explain why Halsey did what she did as part of this never-ending redemption arc that she has. But it just doesn't make sense. Again, it was much better when John was just a freak accident that he could interact with the foreign attack. He was just a natural evolution. But she didn't search out John. She just came across him. 
and realised that he was special. But if all the other children were tested and shared genetic information with the genetic markers that she found, then surely the vast majority, or at least a few other subjects, would have been able to use Forerunner tech as well? But they can't. It's just John. Do the writers not actually understand that there is such a thing as over-explaining? Like, they should have just left it. Humanity needed Spartans. This was the way that we made Spartans. And for every life that we've ruined, we've saved hundreds if not thousands more by having these soldiers and just had done just own your mistake rather than trying to overly explain it and overly justify it with some sort of alien mumbo jumbo that doesn't make sense because john's the only one that can interact so here's an idea if they just had john being a genetic accident that he can interact with the tech and no forerunner influence on the creation of the spartans the story would continue to make sense but they're manipulating the source material, injecting throwaway lines that if you manage to catch, like this one, and actually dissect it, it damages the integrity of the story. Star system. Initiate. So basically, the spikes of bomb guys. Give me one reason why I shouldn't kill this guy right now. Honestly, nothing comes to mind. And that's the Kai that we should have had the whole time. Someone who's almost lockstep with Chief. Someone that Chief can rely on. We need his face. Attached. I like that. Now this is the one type of acting that Pablo Schreiber is actually quite good at, and that's basically just being angry all of the time. And I actually like it in this scene. More so, I like this. That little smirk, just further evidence, that's the Kai that we should have. These Spartans are my life's work. So Ackerson slightly repents and turns around and says that he cares about Spartans, he doesn't want the Spartan 3s to all be massacred, and, well, that they're his life's work. And yet we've got a show which, because they've condensed the timeline so ridiculously stupidly, that Perez has been a Spartan 3 for, like, four actual days, and apparently she's being set up to be one of the more competent ones. So... I'd hardly sit here and turn around and say that these are your life's work if one of your most competent soldiers may well end up having a lifespan of less than five days as a Spartan. But again, what makes a Spartan? Because the show doesn't tell us. Doesn't tell us what's happened to these guys. Realistically, his entire life's work might as well just be, well, we're going to call you a Spartan, so you're a Spartan. Cool. It's that sort of stupidity that is just infecting everything in this show. There's not enough time to set her up as a Spartan. There's not enough rationale as to why she is a Spartan. And there's no rationale as to why her competency rating has gone from a negative number to infinity by comparison. So, I, I, I'll be honest, I can't really be bothered with continuing to talk about this just pile of shit where... Quan has to be the key to everything. Basically, she is the magic character that everyone can rely on to answer every question that needs to be answered just because Quan is there. So the stupid cave paintings that she was painting on the rubble apparently have given her the gift of knowing exactly what she needs to do in order to open this gate. And she opens it because she is the center of this story. Not Chief, the Quan Show. And it's just another trope where there's a female character which is injected to be the focal point that connects everything. And I haven't seen that for ooh, about a day. But I would imagine that I'm probably going to be saying the words, this just doesn't make sense, at some point in the very near future. Well, I came here to punch a hole in your chest. Do it. Just do it. If you just punched a hole in his chest, I'd instantly feel better about the show. I didn't give the orders wrong, Rachel. But you followed them, and I followed you. Why did you follow him? You trusted Chief, remember, but you ignored everything about Chief in order to, as far as I could see, further your own career. You wanted Chief's job. So Ackerson basically once again shows that he has a conscience and is finally round to doing the right thing. So Chief basically tells him that he is going to own up about everything that he did and effectively bury Perengovsky at the same time, which I would imagine is going to land him in some sticky water as well. He basically turns around and says that it'll be the end of him as well, which... 
So we're back to the three Brainiacs and the thing that looks like a Stargate. Quan has obviously seen these visions of how to open the door by moving the stars to how they were when the Forerunners existed. We don't know how, we don't know why. The writers don't want to answer those questions, they just want to present them. It just doesn't make sense. So they open the door and they go in. The central segment is like the ideograph for growth, but the symbol at the top usually has a negative connotation. No, I'm not being funny, but if a door had something you knew was negative on it, would you open it? Because the way that these guys are just blindly opening doors that are locked with reasonably difficult puzzles, did it ever occur to them that there might be a reason that the doors are shut? There could have been a space plague in here. But for people who are being penned as being really intelligent leaders of their field, they're all acting particularly thick. They just open the door willy-nilly, no protection needed. It just... The, whatever would happen with containment protocols, you wouldn't enter these spaces unprotected until you knew that they were safe. It's just moronic, and not how any medical professional today would act. So they enter the room, heedless of any potential risks, and go in and stare lovingly at the corpse of an alien. No one knows how they died. They could have died from a space plague. That could end up killing all of humanity. But no, they're just like, oh my god, we've seen an alien, someone who built this place, dead on the floor, clutching something in their hand. Now, not being funny, I've got a feeling that this item is going to be really important, somehow. And whatever the explanation is, it's going to suck. Touch it. So they're just saying, don't touch it. You're in a room where you're sharing the air with this thing. Like, it's just so bad. And it's all to do with the pacing. That There's no thought given to how would a master biologist deal with this situation knowing all of the potential risks that could happen. There's no thought given, and because they need to move the story forward quickly because of their stupid pacing that they have at the moment, largely because they've wasted enormous segments of the episodes, let alone the entire series, on utter shit, where they could have spaced out these explanations and actually lended them more weight. Instead, they... but yeah, instead they just go, yeah, fuck it, willy-nilly. But instead, they just go for it. Nah. That's just utter bullshit. There's absolutely no way. If they're running, how would they know the exact second to jump before the floor goes? It's just convenient crap. I'd much rather they were just allowed to run to the end and then the bridge disappeared. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, that's all right. So the door's shut, the lights start sparkling red. Quan goes, it's spreading the monster or some crap, and then that's basically all we know of that. So again, there's loads of questions I could turn around and point out here, but what's the point of asking them when they're almost certainly not going to answer all of them? Tell me you got it. Are you retarded? Again, with the utter stupidity. Like, these are supposed to be both scientists. Let's just take random artifacts off of corpses that could have died in any way shape or form like they all deserve to die so we rejoin mckay i mean does anyone care at this point so there's a bit of yapping going on and then she brands herself like so to show her loyalty to the arbiter so they are now bonded now i know that this arbiter is not our arbiter but they're treating him like he could be and i've just about had enough of him he's just a sad character that's now beholden to mckee and mckee shouldn't even exist so when it comes down to it soren decides to get involved and and basically start cracking heads, who these guys are coming to effectively beat the crap out of his son. So I can completely get behind why you would crack their heads. But the interesting thing is, his wife calls out for him, because guess what? She needs him to be violent. So again, it's okay for him to be violent when it suits her, but she finds violence reprehensible. Hypocrite. 
when he knocks the last guy down, why doesn't he start running after his son? Why does he just stand for the camera and yell his son's name? Don't talk about the ones who don't come home, they just... Why have these two characters reversed? Perez is apparently the brave Spartan now and John's acting like the emotional wreck. It's getting to the point where every scene in this episode with Perez just goes to show more and more that the development of Perez as a character is just pure trash. There's no other way I can put it. It's been like four days, maybe five now, since the fall of Reach, and she's acting like a completely different person in such a tiny space of time. In episode one, which is a little over a week ago, in universe time, she didn't bring a weapon. When she picked up a weapon, she couldn't load the bloody shotgun. And she was awarded a medal for it. I'm guessing it was a participation trophy. And then a few days after that, she didn't fight at all in the Fall of Reach. She spent the whole episode being an absolute emotional wreck. And then left Reach on a civilian transport, despite being a marine who should have been fighting and buying time for civilians to escape. And yet now, four or five days later, she's a Spartan. And there's no difference between her four or five days ago and now, other than this change in personality. There's no talk about enhancements. So by this supposed logic of being a Spartan, you just call yourself a Spartan. And then Perez mentions the whole crap with the coin. The coin. It's all about the coin. If anyone didn't know what the crap with the coin is, is... Halsey gave him a coin and made him flip it again and again and again. And he called it heads 11 times and it was heads. But it wasn't because he thought it would be heads. It's because he knew it was heads. This whole conversation with Perez goes down the line of... And was it heads because it was heads? Or was it heads because you made it be heads? Ooh. So basically... They are now writing John as essentially having magic powers and the ability to affect or bend the universe to his will. So we've now got Halo with a side helping of the Mayrox. It's just shit. I suppose it does. Does anyone even care? I mean, you've been so flippant with the bloody risks that, like, I don't... I. It could be housing a man-eating virus for all I care. In fact, I wouldn't mind if it held a man-eating virus, just to kill you stupid assholes. Knowing the writers, though, it's probably the cure to the Flood, so they never actually have to deal with the Flood as part of the story, and can just take a massive dump on the IP. This is Master Chief John 11. See when the story of what happened on Reed. So then we have the big announcement, the announcement that Chief is still alive, and no one in the room seems shocked in any way, shape, or form. Perengovsky looks like she's starting to realise that she's screwed, one way or the other. And Ackerson, well, starts to be venomous, gloating Ackerson. And he gloats a little hard and gets arrested. So, yeah, see how that turns out. So there you go, guys. He's jumping to Seoul, to the Covenant fleet. The system that they're aware of. A system that they have apparently mapped. But, for whatever reason, they missed the fuck offering. Now, it could well be that their sensors are somehow gravity-orientated and they can pick up the gravity of bodies. But seeing as the ring apparently has some sort of effect on these same sensors, you would have seen that when you mapped the system, and surely you would have investigated it and therefore discovered the ring. It's just... crap. Just utter, utter crap. So, Chief jumps into the system, and we've got a very tasty-looking Covenant fleet here. So, you would think that there's going to be a fleet battle in the final episode. I mean, we'll see, because if it's anything like the Fall of Reach, they'll probably gloss over it so hard that we'll get about 15 seconds of seeing something explode, and then nothing. So, I'm not exactly expecting big things from the finale of this season, but we'll see how it goes. And then Chief sees the halo, fade to black, and 
end of episode. So, that's the end of another throwaway, actionless episode. As I've said before, I know this isn't the game universe. It's not wholly based on the official canon or storyline, which is pretty obvious by this point. It's based on their theoretical silver timeline, so an alternate reality, basically. And the problems with this show are directly linked to that very simple point, though. Now, personally, I think that you could have had a grounded story based on the real canon. Your core audience, the people who've played and loved the games, actually want that on the screen. And by deviating from that, you are not giving that core audience what they want, which is genuinely moronic. Because if you give them what they want, and it's shit to everyone else, you might still have an audience. But if you don't, and it's still shit, almost no one likes it. Now, I know that there's people out there who have liked this season, and I am not disputing that there have been small elements of this season which have been good. It's just you're wading through a torrent of bullshit in order to get to them, and they are rushed over so terrifically fast that you're just back to wading through more bullshit again. And that is all I can find that's memorable. If I'm being 100% honest, there are better moments in season one than there is in any of season two and season one was a catastrophe so what does that make season two it sure as shit doesn't make it good when you've got a show that has more bollocks less action and overall more forgetfulness now i do appreciate that they are adapting some source material from the halo books as well but the proportion of people who will have read those books will be infinitely smaller than those who've played the games and from what i remember from the books they were okay and I can see where they're cherry-picking parts of that for this series, like Ackerson, for instance. But the books were telling a story that was so much more engaging. The plots made sense because the motivations of people were adequately explained. For instance, in the books, Ackerson hates Spartan 2s because his brainchild is the Spartan 3s, and he was doing his research into the Spartan 3s at the same time that Halsey was doing her research into the Spartan 2s. So he wants to be basically Billy Big Bollocks. He wants to be the person who's in charge of the super soldiers. So he actively tries to marginalize or discredit the Spartan 2 program so that his program is the program that goes forward. You could have explained that and then had him send Cobalt Team into Visegrad Relay knowing that the Covenant were on the planet and that they would die, send them into the trap, so that his type of Spartan would be embraced. And that almost certainly would have been good. This show, as a whole, explains absolutely nothing about any character's motivation. That's probably doing it a disservice. It explains next to nothing. Now, people could turn around and say, do you need to be shown everything? No, I don't. I can pick up on the tiniest references, which is part of the problem that I have with the show. Because a lot of the tiniest references are retarded. And I'm genuinely sat here going, why? And if I can ask a why, the problem is, is the show has not already answered the question within the development. And the amount of these references which are turning into whys is almost infinite at this point. If I had one, just one overarching question that I could ask the writers right now, it would be, why is the timeline so condensed? Why was the fall of Reach only four to five days ago in-universe? Because all of these things raise even more significant issues. How can Cortana manipulate the Covenant so quickly? How can Perez be a useless soldier one week and a Spartan the next? A Spartan who acts like they've had combat experience, where so far their combat experience has been getting their ass kicked being unable to load a shotgun, and not fighting at all in the biggest battle that you could be part of. Now, all of these things, with spacing, development, explanation, character arcs, could be explained, and could make perfect sense. But they don't, because the writing is crap. It's shoddy. The entire show is shoddy. Other questions that this show raises, and I've already covered it. How can Perengovsky get promoted? To be the head of the UNSC? Or Oni, even though she says she's not part of Oni. Despite having one of the biggest scandals and failures 
and being a significant subordinate in season one. How can Cortana appear anywhere she wants now, despite not being able to do this in season one? She could only appear because of a thing that was injected inside of Chief, alongside her mushed up brain goo, or she could appear on specific small pads. How can McKee get the map to Halo from one artifact, when in season one, we know you need both, and they have to fit together in order to deliver the map. How did the Covenant get onto Reach to disable the Visegrad relay so that they could get onto Reach undetected? Because they would have been detected getting onto Reach. Now I could go on and on and on, basically with questions which are enormous and groundbreaking to the structure of the actual story. But there's never any answers given. They're just supposed to be glossed over, forgotten about. There's only one thing that the writers have succeeded at doing with Halo. It's using the artistic license that they've been given by changing the timeline and creating an alternate universe to butcher everyone's expectations of anyone who loves the Halo universe and replace it with drivel that does not make sense. But those are my thoughts on the not so great, to be polite, series of Halo. But if you've liked the video, please like it, please subscribe for more content, but with that, that's it for me, so that's it for you.